I want to thank uh, Audrey and uh, Watermark and Conference for Women for having me here at this big, wonderful conference, All for Women. Uh, and I think it's a big reminder that uh, we are not alone as we try to make sense of our lives and our work and our communities. And that's what a lot of my work is about. Uh, so here's a glimpse of uh, some of the projects I've made, ways I've tried to reach out to people in public space to share more ideas, uh, to share more of our memories, to share more of our anxieties, <laughs> and uh, to share more of our aspirations. And all of it is about reimagining the ways that our communities can be built and designed, and how our places can better reflect what matters to us as a community and as individuals. So today I want to talk about uh, the value of both civic and emotional introspection in public space to help us improve our communities and our well-being. Uh, and also how you can think creatively about how you approach your, your work and your personal development. And I want to start by sharing a quick story about someone who has inspired me. And uh, I think it's a great um, story about uh, where good ideas come from. So this is a true story about a man named Joseph Paxton, who was a gardener in the 1800s. And he was the first person in England to grow the giant water lily plant. So the giant water lily is the biggest flowering plant in the world. And it can grow up to eight feet in diameter. And uh, it has this special cross-ribbed structure that gives the lily pad a really rigid form. And this made Joseph wonder how strong it really was. So he put his child on it and uh, it still floated, um, but he didn't stop there. He uh, somehow found other people's children and loaded them onto the lily pad too and discovered it could support a whopping five kids. So when he realized just how strong the lily pad was, he wondered um, what if this structure could be applied to other things. And so he used the same structure to create experimental greenhouses. And then he made this, the Crystal Palace, this gigantic cast iron and glass building in London for the Great Exhibition of 1851. And more than 14,000 people came together in this space to celebrate the latest technology during the Industrial Revolution. So Joseph translated the structure of the giant water lily plant into this gigantic building, and he was knighted for his work. So I like this story a lot because I, uh, I aspire to have the openness of mind where the strength of a leaf can lead you to reimagine the way we build our buildings. It's because he was curious and he tried things out and he kept an open mind. And I think that's the core of how good ideas develop. And because of that attitude, Joseph the gardener also became Joseph the architect, which makes me think about the idea of disciplines. You know, we can make disciplines as small or as big as we like. Disciplines are just one way to categorize fields uh, of study and interest. And uh, there are many spaces between traditional disciplines, and no one says you can't go outside of the lines. So it seems only natural that we make our own disciplines out of the bits and pieces that we're interested in. You know, that each and every one of us has a unique discipline that's made up of our, uh, our, of our life experiences, um, our personal interests, uh, and this continues to change as we grow and change. So my background is in architecture, graphic design, and urban planning. And over time, these disciplines and my experiences working with communities around the world and my evolving questions, um, they, they, uh, they inform the things I do today. And they turned into these interactive experiments in public space. And I'll share a few with them with you today. So I live in New Orleans now, and I love it. Uh, here's a shot of downtown. And just east of the French Quarter is the Marigny and Bywater, where I live. Uh, and it's full of all these uh, colorful shotgun houses that are uh, so damn cute, I want to like pet them. <laughs> and uh, I think it's interesting to see how many hybrid businesses there are in my neighborhood, businesses serving multiple needs. So this place is a 
uh, a laundromat slash liquor store slash sometimes Indian restaurant. Um, there's a pet supply store slash art supply store. Uh, there's a Mardi Gras party beads supply store that has doubled as a grocery ever since the main one closed after Katrina. Uh, and there are also vacant storefronts. And I think that many of us walk by underused areas of our cities and have opinions of what we like to see in these places. Um, and that made me wonder, well, what if we could easily say what we want, where we want it? So I made these fill-in-the-blank stickers as a kind of crude tool and experiment, like a love child of street art and urban planning. And they're made of vinyl, so they can be easily removed without damaging property. And I put boxes of free stickers uh, in businesses around the city. And I posted grids of blank stickers on vacant storefronts all across New Orleans, so anyone walking by could quickly fill one out. And I was amazed to see uh, the range of thoughtful responses from a butcher shop to a community garden, uh, from a place to buy flowers for my baby, to heaven. You know, it's this fun, uh, low barrier tool to provide civic input on site. Uh, and people's responses, they, they reflect all the hopes and dreams and colorful imaginations across different neighborhoods. Um, you know, I, I started using cheap tools like this at the beginning because I was just trying to do what I could with what I had. And only later on did I realize that it had all these other benefits. Um, these analog tools are really accessible to everyone. Um, it's anonymous, so you can open up in ways you might not have otherwise. Uh, it doesn't put you on the spot, so it allows shyer people like me uh, to share just as much with their community. And uh, the, handwritten, the handwritten responses, they uh, reveal a lot of personality that often gets lost with digital tools. So some people want better infrastructure like roads properly paved, um, sidewalks repaired, and bike racks installed. And some people want better food options like an affordable farmer's market, a Chinese restaurant, a donut slash flower shop, another good hybrid idea or an entire building covered in bacon. Uh, one of the things I really love about this project is the range of responses from the functional to the poetic. This is one of my favorites. I wish this was full of nymphomaniacs with PhDs. <laughs> Sexy and smart, right? <laughs> now, some people dream of making it their own, like Kian and Kaylin's Seafood Place, my art gallery, my produce market and cafe. And some people dream of making it together. Uh, I really love this one. Someone wrote, I wish this was a bakery. And someone else wrote, if you can get the financing, I will do the baking. Uh, and that brings us to the larger question. You know, what if residents had better tools to come together and shape the future of their communities? You know, what if we want the same thing? What if we could prove there was a strong enough customer base for a new business or service to open? Uh, so my friends Dan and T. Param and I, we joined forces and we took this idea a few steps further and created Neighborland, this tool for residents and organizations to come together to collaborate on the places they care about. So you can say what you want in your community. You can see what other people want and click Me Too. So that one neighbor who wants you know, the ability to um, recycled glass can become 10, 20, 30, and beyond. And there's a page for each idea uh, where people can share local knowledge, updates, meeting times, petitions, and beyond. You know, Neighborland came out of our pain points, and we've been to many community meetings where the voice of the community uh, often ends up being the handful of people who can make it or the loudest people in the room. And that made us wonder, how can more people get involved over time, and how can the quiet people share just as much as the loud ones? So organizations can use Neighborland to ask questions like, where do you want bike lanes in New Orleans? Uh, what would you do with $1,000 to make your Memphis neighborhood greener? Or how can we make UN Plaza a better place? And pair these online pages with interactive public installations where people can write in or text in their ideas um, from the street to, make, uh, to reach as many people as possible who care about that place. And together, people have turned ideas into reality, like uh, new bike lanes and signage, uh, food truck regulation reforms, blight improvements, 
and test runs of night markets that have proven to be so popular that they are now becoming regular things. Um, so Neighborland has helped organizations and residents to work together to make incremental changes. And uh, this has taught me that small interventions can lead to better informed big ones. You know, starting out small is a really great way to keep an open mind uh, and, and to keep learning and questioning and iterating. And when we make democracy more accessible, we make places that are more loved, more cared for, uh, and more meaningful to us for the rest of our lives. I continued to experiment uh, on abandoned buildings. Um, and all of my projects come from questions I have. And my questions became a lot more personal after I lost someone that I loved. Um, her name was Joan, and she was a mother to me for 15 years. She was the one who encouraged me to pursue my creative dreams when I was 18. And her death was sudden and really unexpected, and there were still so many things that she wanted to do. And uh, I spent a long time um, full of grief and depression. And with time, I felt gratitude for the time we had together. And eventually, I found clarity in my life by thinking about death so much. But I, uh, I struggled to maintain this perspective. You know, I think it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day and forget what really matters to you. So I wanted a daily reminder, and I wanted to know what was important to the people around me. So after getting permission from the property owner, my neighbors, uh, the neighborhood association, I made this uh, homemade stencil that said, before I die, I want to. Uh, and with help from old and new friends, I painted the side of this crumbling house with chalkboard paint and stenciled it with this prompt so that anyone walking by could pick up a piece of chalk, reflect on their lives, and share their personal aspirations in public space. Uh, again, it was all an experiment, and I didn't know what to expect, but I thought, well, uh, because it was cheap to make, it's no big deal if it doesn't work out. Well, by the next day, the wall was entirely filled out, and it kept growing, and this neglected space became a constructive one, and people's responses made me laugh out loud and cry, and they consoled me during some of my toughest times. You know, I understood my neighbors in new and enlightening ways, and I think most importantly to me, uh, I saw that I'm not alone as I'm trying to make sense of my life. The neighbors introduced themselves in front of the wall while reading through the day's responses, and people who uh, ordinarily had little to do with one another began taking care of it. Um, and the grandmother who lives across the street told me, you know, people are around all the time now. The block is safer. Now, uh, the wall in New Orleans was up for seven months in 2011, and uh, it ended for the happiest of reasons. A new owner bought the property, and the house became a home again. Um, but that wasn't the end of the project. I uh, posted a few photos online, and it spread. And my inbox blew up with uh, hundreds of messages from people around the world who wanted to make a wall with their community. So I created a website with tons of resources. Uh, and now, three years later, thanks to passionate people who have spearheaded their own walls, there are now over 500 Before I Die walls uh, in over 70 countries and stenciled in over 35 languages. Um, yeah. <laughs> And it has been one of the greatest experiences of my life to see this tiny experiment uh, in my neighborhood grow into this global project. Uh, and I'd like to share a few photos of these walls around the world and some things that people wrote on them. Before I die, I want to organize 1,000 exhibitions. Before I die, I want to become a real businesswoman. Before I die, I want to be accepted by my parents. Before I die, I want to be a stripper and a nun at the same time. <laughs> Before I die, I want to master the trumpet. Before I die, I want to see where my grandma grew up. Before I die, I want to hold her one more time. Before I die, I want to stop being afraid. These public walls are like an honest mess. You know, they're an honest mess of the longing and pain and, and joy and insecurity and gratitude and fear and wonder that you find in every neighborhood. You know, everyone is going through challenges in their life, and there's great comfort in knowing that you're not alone. But uh, it's easy to forget this because there are a lot of barriers to opening up. And uh, while those barriers remain, it's easy to become impersonal um, and forget the humanity in the people around us and become even adversarial. 
Um, during one of my gloomiest periods of existential confusion, I uh, found a lot of comfort in this book called The Middle Passage by James Hollis. And he said, in the end, we are only tiny frightened animals doing our best to survive amid other tiny frightened animals. And uh, that may sound a little grim, but it always consoles me. You know, I uh, return to the sentence when I lose perspective, and it's something that I remember when I consider our communities. You know, our personal anxieties extend into our public life, and many of the conflicts in our communities come from a lack of trust and understanding. But over time, I realize that this uh, personal anonymous prompt uh, in public, it offers a gentle first step towards honesty and vulnerability in public which can lead to trust and understanding. And these are really essential elements for a more compassionate city, a more compassionate community, which can not only help us make better places, but can help us become our best selves. You know, death is something that we're often discouraged to talk about or, or even think about. You know, if someone brings it up, the other person might say, well, don't go there, it's too sad. You don't need to think about it until you're older. Well, none of us know how much time we have left, and it's easy to postpone our deepest needs, it's easy to take the people we love for granted, and uh, it's far too easy to neglect our relationship with ourselves. And in our age of increasing distractions, uh, I think it's more important than ever to remember that life is brief and tender, and regularly contemplating death as the Stoics and other philosophers have encouraged for centuries is a very powerful tool to help you restore perspective and remember the things that make your life meaningful to you. Uh, and I'm happy to share that the Before I Die book is out now. It's a celebration of these walls around the world um, and the stories behind them and like communal inspiration to help you maintain perspective and stir your mind about the things that matter most to you. And I'll be signing books after this talk uh, in Hall A next to the bookstore, so please stop by if you're interested. Now, I've been thinking about the passages of life. You know, in different stages, our calling evolves and grows. As children, our calling is to play. And then we try to learn the ways of the world, to explore our energies and interests and talents. In the next phase of life, we try to become independent, you know, follow our dreams, make a living, be a part of society. And then try to accept responsibility, nurture our family and relationships, you know, balance work and the other parts of our lives. Uh, but our journey doesn't end there, and we continue to learn and grow throughout our entire lives as much as we allow ourselves. And a lot of our time is devoted to seeking the right job or marriage or reputation or outward success, but that's not enough to be psychologically mature. And Carl Jung said it's easier to go to Mars or to the moon than it is to penetrate one's own being. And he coined the term individuation, which is the process in which someone becomes who they truly are. Uh, and I think in the second half of life, the question becomes, who now, apart from your roles, are you? And do you have the bravery to deconstruct your identity, um, your urges, your anxieties, your, your neuroses, your confusions, um, to explore what you need to explore to be at peace with yourself? You know, this is what really interests me now. How can I do this for myself? And how can our public spaces become more contemplative and more nourishing to our mental health? Uh, like this project, I want to share one last project with you. I spent a month living in Las Vegas, where I was artist in residence at the Cosmopolitan, and created a project in their gallery space. And uh, as they say, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, but I thought, well, what if we could share safely with full disclosure? I'd recently confessed something to someone I cared about, and it left me feeling really confused. Uh, when I traveled to Japan a few years ago, I was inspired by the Shinto Shrine prayer walls where people can write a prayer on a wooden plaque and hang it on this collective wall for the spirits of gods to receive them. So inspired by that and post-secret and Catholicism, I invited a people to anonymously share their confessions and see the confessions of the people around them in the heart of the Las Vegas Strip. So people could write and submit their confessions on wooden plaques uh, in the privacy of confession booths, and I hung them up uh, on the wall so they gathered over time and projected select responses on large canvases and painted them. And by the end of the exhibit, over 1,500 confessions were displayed on the walls, from your name is tattooed on my ass, to I like porn more than my husband does. <laughs> to so I still love her, two girlfriends and five years later. Yes. Oh. From I'm scared I'll die alone, which I saw a lot, to I eat too much cheese.
And over the last year, I felt everything from joy to despair, and I saw it on these walls too. And when we feel fear or anxiety or confusion, we often do our very best to hide it from others. But what if we could make more safe places to share? You know, there's great power in knowing you're not alone. You're not alone as you're trying to make sense of your life. You're not the only one who feels like they're barely keeping it together. You know, I've been thinking about why we came together in the first place. Uh, the city historian Lewis Mumford once wrote that uh, the origins of society were not just for physical survival, but for a more valuable and meaningful kind of life. You know, some of the earliest gathering places were graves and sacred groves. We gathered so we could grieve together and, and worship together and console one another and be alone together. You know, our public spaces can play a profound role to help us make sense of the beauty and tragedy of life with the people around us. And through opportunities for collective intro introspection uh, in public space, I think we can gain great value in both uh, self-realization and communal kinship. So I want to end by saying what you might consider your weaknesses uh, can become your strengths. You know, being an introvert in an urban planning world where the loudmouths ruled uh, made me wonder how the process could be different and more inclusive. And my experiences with loss and, and depression and confusion have often been the fire for a lot of my experiments. So be sensitive to your struggles, uh, to, to your shortcomings, and the moments that you feel out of place. Because if you take the time to understand them, uh, you may find an opportunity to change the system. Um, and be open to the unexpected. You can only have new insight into your, your life and work when you're open uh, and, and available to it, when you're receptive to it. Which brings us back to this guy, Joseph Paxton, gardener and architect. Um, I think his story is so compelling because it shows how creative we can all be if we approach our life and work with the right attitude because it wasn't some unattainable flash of genius. It was simply that he was curious, and he tried things out, and he kept an open mind. And that's something that we can all do. So you can learn more about my projects in these places. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. I live